Good afternoon. I am Anush Marotra, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this episode in the George Talks Business Series. Today, I am delighted to introduce our honored guest, Dr. Jimena Hartsock, a tech entrepreneur, the founder of Tech Apprenticeships, and co-founder of phone to action and a GW alumna. Thank you for joining us, Jimena. Thank you, Anush, for having me. And congratulations so, Jimena, on the bicentennial, I guess, to all of us, right? <laughs> thank you. Yes, to all of us indeed. Uh, you know, we I wanted to start with a little bit of your background. I know that you are you come from Santiago, Chile. You have worked in the DC government as an educator and an administrator. Can you walk us through that journey and when and how you became a tech entrepreneur? It's a long journey. <laughs> um, actually, I am uh, also 100% indigenous. Uh, if you see that little um, piece of art there, that is a, um, is a is something called Trape La Cucha because uh, my parents are both indigenous in Chile. So uh, they migrated to Santiago, to the capital, uh, looking for opportunities. And then when I, just when I finished uh, school, I, uh, you know, I told them I, I wanted to, to finish college, I, I, I told them I really wanted to, to move to the US. And my dad uh, was a very big fan of a country movies, so John Wayne and all of that stuff. And he was a, a very good reader. Uh, and so he knew about the history uh, of the US, of all of the presidents, he knew their bio. So he was actually very excited when I told him I wanted to, to come here and i wanted to come to to the capital because you know i felt like that was like the center of the the activity of any country and you know in my inner ignorance i didn't really know that much more about it um but uh, i knew i had to go to university so i came here i didn't have really any any um networks here or i spoke no english whatsoever i just bought a dictionary i remember uh spanish english dictionary and i learned like that and then just practicing and i took some classes but really very minimal um so uh, i was uh, by degree was a, a, a spanish and philosophy high school teacher that was my degree in chile and um when I came here, uh, you have to go through the convalidation of credit. So they have to approve them and all of that. So I took a really low um, entry job first, but I was doing all of those jobs immigrants do. I was a bartender and nanny, all of those things. And one day I saw an ad in the Washington Post that said that they needed aids for an aid. Um, and I, and I, that's how I got into this government. So I was making $10,000 at the time. So I had to have all of these all other jobs that I had before. I was like in houses, all of that uh, for several years. And then my boss, it uh, helped me to, to get my degree uh, to work here. So then I, I started working, um, you know, uh, using my, my degree. Uh, and eventually, uh, you know, just by working in the schools in DC, one of the principals asked me to apply to the assistant principalship of the school. She said, you do such a great job. We'd love to have you here. So I applied and I got the job. So I worked there. And then uh, the superintendent said, well, you do a good job here. Why don't you go to another school, turn it around? So I went to Ross. I applied there. I passed the, the I was selected. So I became the principal there. And this is the, the kind of like the funny story that um, Adrian Fenty, the mayor later on, he was a council member and he came to the school to visit because of the efforts we were making and, and he saw me there and uh, later on when he became a mayor, he brought me into the administration where I had, you know, uh, several jobs. I was assistant superintendent of the schools, director of Parks and Rec. Uh, and then when he uh, didn't get um, elected again, I moved on. And so I went to uh, work for a national nonprofit and uh, I was a grassroots advocacy uh, manager. And in that work, I realized that we needed technology to scale the one-on-one -on -one interactions uh, with people um, to organize them to come and, 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 and talk to lawmakers. So I thought, you know, it's gotta be an app for this and it was no app for it. So I, uh, a friend of mine, uh, 
uh, I started looking for people to join me, to, um, you know, a, a tech co-founder because I had no entrepreneurship or technology experience. And a friend of mine introduced me to Jeb, who was her husband, after I had talked to lots of people who told me this was a terrible idea. He actually listened and we launched Fun to Action and that was the story. <laughs> Great. What, what an inspiring story, Jimena, and what, what a great successful uh, immigrant story uh, also as well. Uh, so you talked about Phone to Action. You started uh, Phone to Action for those of uh, in our audience who are not as familiar with it, um, perhaps a little bit more as to how that app works, what exactly does it do. And, and, and more importantly, I also want to ask you, obviously, your hard work and your grit and your, and your passion has made you successful throughout your career, it looks like, from the story itself that one could tell. Uh, I would love to also hear about, as you go through uh, the app description, about uh, how do you end up finally growing that company? And then and, and what is it that makes you so proud of what you have achieved with that company? So from True Action, uh, people may not know the brand name, but you certainly it's almost impossible that you haven't run into a campaign of fun to action because especially during the past election it was used by many celebrities including uh, beyonce madonna jay-z uh, ariana grande billy Eilish, and you name it foo fighters i mean just the 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 the, the, the list is long to um motivate people to register to vote to check uh, about their candidates and to vote the early and the later on to, to, to vote the day off. Um, so it's been heavily used for elections. We have, it's a platform, it's a technology platform for digital grassroots advocacy and for public affairs. So organizations such as American Heart Association, the Chamber of Commerce, companies like Expedia, or, and um, uh, organizations on the public side, like like that are on the on the media side, like the Grammys, they use Fund to Action to mobilize people to push for the changes in the policy that they feel that are needed to be done. So it's a movement maker, but it's an independent connector between people and their lawmakers. It's extremely effective because the relationships are one on one. It's not an app. It's a suite of tech tools, and you you will see it um, as part of many, many efforts that are out there, such as UNICEF is a client um, and, uh, you know, many others. So that that is what Fund to Action is. And it started as, as a very simple application that I thought at the time it was extremely needed, which it was a technology that could be used to connect people with their lawmakers, to write them an email, to send them a tweet. At the time, we could also do Facebook messages and to make phone calls. And then people can share later on in a variety of ways through WhatsApp to Facebook, whichever way they want. Um, and that makes that connection extremely valuable because it's a person connecting with their own lawmaker. And later on, we built other tools, social media tools, the election tools, etc. And to the second part of your question, what makes me the most proud, uh, Fontro Action started as a response to a need that I had when I was a manager. Um, and so that desire to respond to a need, it continued on for years in the company because I was happy and I was actually, I feel honored that I always wore the customer hat. I created the Office of Customer Success and I ran that office and then when the company grew, I was managing you know, many other teams. I was the CEO of the company and Jack was the C CEO. And we, we collaborated, but despite every advice that we got from uh, people in, in tech that told us do not do service, we never did service. We always sold the technology as a SaaS product, but we always kept the customer uh, you know, as a priority. And that guide us through because when you start looking at what the competitors are doing or when you start reading what the press says about somebody, you know, that can be very distractive for an entrepreneur. And I think the most successful businesses are those that are very genuine. 
think about Clubhouse. I mean, if you think about the definition of Clubhouse, it seems like so simple. Who is going to go and listen to other people talking? But it's marvelous. It's a genius idea in execution. So I think that is what it makes me the most proud that we build a company from a scratch, from an idea, and we, um, without much experience in anything, at least me, we were able to to grow the the the, the company uh, through you know we raised venture capital several times, uh, you know raised millions of dollars in venture capital. We 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 got our own super large space. We gave a lot of a lot of work to a lot of people, a lot of immigrants, and we had an amazing list of customers. And then the company was attractive to many people that wanted to 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 take a stake on it to buy it and then we were able to later on buy two more companies um merge them all and now Fontraction is a very large enterprise well congratulations i think there were three different things that you did there first of course you identified a great gap in the market the second you kept your focus and the third of course that you kept the customer always in mind which are key uh, i i certainly have heard so many times about the successful entrepreneurs, which you, you kept in mind. And uh, we recently hosted a mini series of sessions on Josh Talks Business, covering a range of topics uh, to AI, ethics, policy, and application in financial services and other fields. So can you talk a little bit about the current trends you have seen and how technology, and in particular artificial intelligence, is actually changing social advocacy and policy debate? It's a very, very important topic, especially now with the debate around uh, Section 230 in Congress. Um, I have, a, along the way, you know, my journey in technology has been one where social impact, advocacy, politics, uh, and philosophy, because of my major, had always been part of that technology journey. So the concerns around data privacy and security were always in mind, at least at the, not only at the technical space in the company, but also, you know, as a human being thinking about how what we do could have an impact on anything. Um, data privacy is part of everything we do. You know, I have a two-year-old son, and we made the decision uh, with my husband to not uh, take pictures of him or of his face and put them on social media. Initially, we said no pictures at all, but then I just couldn't. <laughs> I had to put some pictures of him on Instagram and with my friends and family. And I, I don't, but we don't take any pictures of his face. So we want to protect at least his uh, facial print. Um, and then on the on the you know narrative space, I think there is a lot of uh, talk now about can we actually have consensus reality, knowing that through social media the louder voices take always the consensus. So is that real? Is consensus reality possible? So what I think uh, we're seeing all over the world, we, you know, all of these movements, all of these protests, not only the U.S., I mean, in 2019, there were protests in about 50 countries. Uh, there were millions of people outside uh, protesting against the governments. Uh, what, what we're seeing right now is that that be those those folks who were all using technology to move to move people out i mean some some of them in hours at uh, technologies in some cases like in hong kong very very sophisticated all of them were doing it for a social purpose but then the consensus they were making when they were out sometimes didn't really have consensus. So you saw, for example, in Chile, where I am from, that people had uh, very valid concerns about the 30 years of government after the dictatorship. People were really upset about that. They came out uh, you know, in the millions to protest in the streets in 2019. But then uh, a group of them started doing uh, you know, huge um, just uh, riots, and, and and you know we, we saw all of the all of, all of the typical uh, that comes with it. But we saw also uh, 
very, very uh, uh, strong events of violence. So the metro, metro stations, Chile was very proud of the metro, went uh, on fire and grocery stores, even hospitals. So some of those folks went on their own and started doing that. You know, you always find criminals who look for the opportunity. So I started writing and uh, I have a medium uh, page where I have some of these writings about this new type of person that I call the new citizen. And this is a new citizen who is armed with technology and is very, very impulsive, doesn't have necessarily, uh, it takes the time to, uh, you know, think rather, you know, it's, everything is very rapid with technology. So they put an announcement about a protest out, a lot of people come out, you know, in, in minutes, you know, in the past it would took years years to do the March of Men and all of that. They, they, they had a, had a mayor march and, and all of those. Uh, but now, you know, it takes hours. It's sometimes not even hours. So that new citizen armed with technology, armed with all of that passion and impulsiveness that comes from their, a little bit of their pessimist look of society and the elite as they call us, you know, entrepreneurs, universities, the government, uh, they they revolt on that. But there is an aspect of society that it hasn't developed in many countries. Some countries have it, very small number of them, Denmark, Finland, Holland, but the US, Chile don't, and it's public judgment. So all of those protests that come outside are moved by public opinion that this consensus reality that we're talking about happens really, really quickly over the apps, but then public judgment, which is a society reasoning with each other collectively, having uh, boundaries and limits on how much will they do? Should we put this grocery, grocery store on fire? Should we go and destroy all the windows of Georgetown? Um, you know, the society themselves in groups, not organized, not led by anybody, a leaderless society can actually reason well. So Brexit is an example of people saying, yeah, we don't wanna be part of this. But then when when they were not part of that, they said, oh, oh, uh, I'm not sure if I don't wanna be part of that. And now are all the consequences of Brexit, people are seeing it. Chile is, is seeing some of the other things and the US will as well. So the question is a, it's such an important question and for for the people listening, if you have any role that you 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 play today in society, it's a technology role. Everyone. And every role that we play is also an ethical role because we live in a technology world and the technology world we lived in doesn't have the same rules than the physical world so in the in the virtual world we can con conduct you we can commit any crimes that all, all we will not be able to do in the physical world using trolls using fake personalities all of that stuff uh and in the physical world not, not and so we have to be extra careful and we have to be extra committed to the ethical side of technology, if we're building technology, consuming technology, and especially uh, learning about the technology of the future, the entrepreneurs of GW, uh, which are doing. Well, thank you. Very well put, uh, Jimena. Um, let me move on to the second, uh, um, you know, company that you have founded, Tech Apprenticeship, which makes you a serial entrepreneur now. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the business model for this Tech Apprenticeship uh, as well. And the first time you said when you when you launched or when you founded Phone to Action, you didn't really know much about where it will go and what will what will become of it. It's become such a big company now. Uh, but I want you to now that you've had that experience uh, in the past, uh, what do you think tech? Where do you envision tech apprenticeship to be in five years? My new company, Tech Apprenticeships, is a SaaS company. So we will sell the software a subscription to organizations, companies, and foundations that are in the business of um, apprenticeships or are companies interested in increasing their workforce 
um, and, and having a STEM pipeline. We have a tremendous shortage in the US. We have 1.4 million uh, uh, positions available next year. We only graduate 400,000. Uh, we only have, you know, 2% of uh, Hispanic women, 3% of uh, Black, and 6% of Asian women, and altogether women in, in, in software development at about 24%. So, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do to um, bring, uh, you know, more power to to technology in 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 um, regarding you know um, workforce. So this is a, this is a product that is going to help companies increase their STEM pipeline and at the same time to serve those um, folks that have never had the opportunity to to enter the technology uh, path. So we are trying to match vulnerable communities with the skills that uh, serve the companies so they are successful and the companies are successful um, into these technology apprenticeships and jobs that we call now the new color jobs. They're, you know, uh, for example, cybersecurity analyst, front-end development, QA, uh, jobs of that sort, match them um, with people that have those skills that, you know, perhaps didn't graduate uh, high school or they didn't, um, they, they just they just had a, a path that didn't take them there, they didn't have the exposure. So uh, the technologies that we use are uh, machine learning and GIS for the recruitment portion and the CRM is a social CRM and then the monitoring is done through um, um, GIS as well. So machine learning will be used specifically in high school to make a prediction about the graduation rates uh, and, and identify the individuals with the skills that can be matched with a company that are on the path of graduation today in, in many states. Uh, kids can be all the for four years there and then age out and Will never, you know, they never, they were never on the path to graduation, so they were actually wasting their time there. So we could take them out and put them in a different path. Lots of uh, interest I have already. Uh, it's a big push here in the U.S. Um, we're kind of a little bit behind other countries, but uh, I'm very excited about this. So if there anyone uh, interested in the, the audience to talk more about it i'm still looking i'm putting together the team i'm looking for co-founders and um you asked me too about what's different what i learned you know the first company you learn so much about what not to do in the second company you you learn so much so i feel very confident about this one i am doing it right i'm not um hacking anything through or i'm not rushing anything but i'm you know, I work. I work at fast speed, um, and I want uh, people that are very interested in the in the work, not just to work in a technology company, but actually understand what we're trying to do. Wonderful. So you you actually mentioned you're looking for co-founders. You have also been a mentor and a judge in our uh, GW New Venture competition, and of course, as a business school dean, I'm very happy that uh, at least half of those semifinalists are uh, are, are business school students as well in there. But I wanted to maybe, you, know, you can't be doing everything, you can't be find founding and co-founding every company, but you have ideas. So what, what are the gaps that you are thinking about that are there that you may not be in a position to start companies with, but perhaps aspiring entrepreneurs should focus on? So any, any, any ideas for these uh, budding entrepreneurs with some gap and ideas for that, for them to yes. open their own companies? Yes, so there is a big manufacturing, um, problem in the US. So as we move away from China, we need to be able to manufacture here. So not every technology company has to be software development. We need also people that make things. Um, we, we, we know all of, all of about health, uh, you know, health technology, no matter what it is, uh, you, you know, you are, we, we, we are far from, from not having needs there. But something I'm very interested about is actually uh, recycling plastic recycling. Uh, I'm from Chile. So in the south of Chile, there are, and, and this, this affects, you know, you know, anywhere where there are ports. Um, the, there are a lot of uh, countries that are going through legislation 
to put pressure on uh, the the salmon companies and the you know all of that interest the the fish industry to recycle the plastic immediately and to not keep it around to have a supply chain for the recycled materials to be used again or um, to you know you cannot destroy it completely but to to destroy it as as much as possible in um, in safe manner manners for the environment that's an area that require that is there is a huge gap there uh, there is technology gap there is a manufacturing gap for machines you know if you buy a machine of those here in the us are very expensive many of those are made in uh, china and russia so i think that uh, we have to start thinking a little bit outside you know the clubhouses and the twitters of the world i love clubhouse I get very inspired listening to the conversations there. I follow Eric Weinstein there and uh, Mark Andresen, and I just, um, I just, I just think there is so much there. I, I am fascinated by machine learning and everything that it can do. So exploring anything related to AI and machine, I mean machine learn, AI, AKA machine learning, um, I think is, uh, is the future. And of course, crypto, crypto. I think, I think. We're, we're, I, I don't know, I I invested in Ethereum a long time ago, but I didn't invest enough. And today I'm thinking, oh, uh, but crypto, I mean, look at Max Saylor, the head of uh, MicroStrategies, just became a billionaire by investing in crypto, Elon Musk, and you name it. So it's not just about the money. I mean, the money is important, you know, we should recognize and be okay with saying the money is important because when you have money, you can help others. If you don't can help yourself, you can't help anybody. So money gives you wealth to be able to uh, have an impact in other people, on other people and the environment. But also is the is, is navigating and being part of the future. Imagine how excited the people that went to Mars or were behind the Mars expedition, you know, the Mars helicopter how they feel it's just it's so exciting for us imagine how exciting it is for them so i think having a, a curiosity about areas that are underlooked it will bring you so much passion into the work doing another clubhouse doing another twitter you know the silicon valley <laughs> you know they're all they're all doing those things already no need well, well, thanks for sharing those tips and perhaps you have some extra ones for me after this show is over so that I can be the only recipient of those tips. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you're talking about exciting things and, and of course there is also excitement around the potential innovation district right uh, at GW in the backyard with the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District project. Uh, I, I believe you are involved in that as well a little bit and uh, would love to hear a little bit about your involvement and what, what we should hope to accomplish in the short term and the long term. It sounds very exciting for GW to be involved in. Yes. So Innovation Districts started, uh, you know, while back and Jim Shank has a lot of experience with that because at MIT, in the MIT area, he was uh, in the in the corridor and he, he was involved in, in all of that. So we, we are lucky to have Jim um, on, this, on this effort, but the um, the golden triangle uh team business improvement district team they are very um a, for, a, they're, they're very vision they're visionaries and i i feel i am very impressed that they're not thinking about shutting down this project after the really bad year real estate had with covid so kudos to them for that plus you know, we have a woman CTO, Lindsay Parker, who also is a champion of all of these ideas. She is a lawyer by trade, understands uh, the impact of policy on things. So she will be a great asset. And uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser, who has done a really good job at keeping the the issues uh, of all people in DC in the city you know she's not perfect there's no government no perfect government but keeping all of the issues kind of like the surface and being able to touch them all so 
we have all of these three elements and the support of many other organizations. The Consumer Technology Association is right here. It can help us. We have Department of Labor that can help us to launch apprenticeships, et cetera. So I'm very excited about it. I think GW is one of the most important institutions in the world because of uh, the position that it has in the capital, the number of professors that have had experience not only with policy but also with business so bring business policy they they are they can live separated you know policy allows you to do or not do things in business and those areas algebra gw is extremely strong the venture uh competition is impressive without i i, I don't have adjectives for that because the, the the companies that we saw um you know last week were unbelievable. They were at the same level that you see in any accelerator, uh, nanotechnologies, um, you know, all kinds of great stuff. But um, but the, the 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 point I'm trying to make here, if I know I'm Chilean, so I speak kind of like in circles for the audiences. If you're students or former students or people just want to be engaged, uh, contact us because the the innovation district is going to be a one one of a kind is it's not going to be like like it's going to be better than the others obviously but it's also going to be uh one that is going to put some of those issues that the others haven't been able to touch because they kind of stay very close to the technology uh, they're gonna we're gonna be able to to tackle those um and and have social impact and revive you know open up the city again after pandemic what a great uh opportunity to to, to do all of that, to blossom the city again with, with entrepreneurship and with innovation. So, Jimena, it's been fantastic talking to you, but I want to ask you one last question uh, before we close today. Um, and, and, and that is really about your GW experience. I want you to maybe share a memory of GW, something that which would, would, would qualify as only a GW experience for you. Ha! Huh. Well, first of all, I have my cup here that I got a GW <laughs> at the national competition, Jim sent it to me or, or, or Scott or Justin, I don't know. And I have my little mascot there, I don't know if you see it. Um, and I actually keep the, uh, the, the hat, all of the, the hooding ceremony. Um, so I, you know, I, for, you know, I was, uh, I can, for my accent, you can tell, you know, I haven't even been a year of my accent yet. I was so in love with the universities here. What I remember I went around and, and visited them all when I came and I cried when I saw them. You may think it's cheesy, but I was so touched by the the, the opportunity I had to be able uh, even to, to put a, my, my, my foot on the on the universities because coming from where I was, you know, my family was very, very poor and my parents uh, you know were indigenous and you had to suffer all of what comes, you know, the classism and the discrimination that comes with that. And um, I just saw a GW, uh, you know, every everything I, I, I always hoped for. Not only uh, I remember, you know, uh, having class after 9-11, uh, that was uh, that was pretty, that was, that was, I don't think that experience I can, because it was really close to 11, maybe like a day after or two days after the, the professor asked us if we wanted to cancel and nobody wanted to cancel because everybody wanted to talk about it and hearing from everyone else and you know for me new in the country i was uh i i think that that for life i will remember that and and i think another time that i remember it was very very special for me was hooding hooding ceremony my parents uh, couldn't come my father had cancer at the time and uh my friends and and you know some, some close friends who were there with me and i remember the the day exactly of that i remember seeing the lips that it was at the lips you know the just being there the, near the, the the white house um and you know people talk a lot about the american dream and we have become very cynical over time uh, we always talk about you know the negatives that come with being a person of color and i want to highlight that there is just so much good stuff that happens to people of color like you and i now sharing the stage here being able to talk um 
and that we have to also celebrate those times. So I want to celebrate now that moment because Houdin is a very emotional moment and is kind of comfortable too because you have to go backwards and I was very worried I would fall uh, because I'm very clumsy too. But uh, I remember looking up and at the time my father uh, had my mom, uh, you know, could come because my parents couldn't come because my father had just passed away. And so I remember thinking about him and I remember thanking him for him pushing me to come here and um, everything that uh, UW gave me, I used. I was a principal right after that. I was, uh, you know, all those jobs that I've been able to do. I put my doctor degree with very with a lot of pride on LinkedIn. I don't use it anywhere else. Uh, but I do it because I was a lot of hard work. Uh, the statistics classes were definitely challenging at the time. Uh, we studied a lot of policy and that my degree was very heavy on policy and I had excellent professors. And um, so only good memories from that. And thank you, GW, and congratulations to everyone on the Bicentennial. And thank you, Jimena. In fact, uh, the commencements at the mall is uh, certainly one of my favorite GW, only at GW moments as well. Thank you for a great conversation today and thank you for your authenticity in, in talking to me today. I really appreciate it. I would also like to thank all of you who joined us today and invite you to a very special episode of Josh Talks Business Series next week uh, on Wednesday as part of our GW Bicentennial celebrations. We will be hosting a signature event for the GW School of Business a panel on responsible artificial intelligence. The session will be moderated by Steve Lohr, New York Times journalist, and will feature industry experts across several sectors, including healthcare, financial services, nonprofit, and government. And we are partnering on this event with AI Global, a nonprofit based uh, focused on building safe and fair AI technologies. We hope you will join us then. Thank you again.